Last week I gave what I like to consider at least for now in this series, introduction to what the Bible teaches on Christian fellowship. I would like to continue with that study and I would like to continue without breaking it up. So I would like to do so at least in the next few worship periods, including this afternoon. And that means I'm going to postpone some about, so you would like to be an elder. And uh, we'll take that up because we hit a good stopping point last week and I want to move next into the authority that God has in the New Testament delegated to the elders. So at this point, let's go and look at the matter of Christian fellowship again. Now, if you remember, as we closed out last Sunday's sermon, we pointed out that when you really understand the fellowship existing between the church and God, and then, of course, between members of the church, it all comes down to our being active and workers for the Lord. We have entrusted to us, indeed, we're authorized by God. He expects it of us. It's a part of what it is to be faithful to Jesus, to be doing the work of God that only the church of our Lord can do. Now, when we are of the same mind and the same judgment, which we're commanded to be in matters having to do with salvation, 1 Corinthians 1.10, then we will labor and work together with the same mind and the same judgment because it's all motivated by Jesus' mind as revealed in the New Testament in fellowshipping in all things pertaining to the church, whether it's worship, uh, studying the Bible together, uh, whatever the case may be in the work of the church and the many facets of the work of the church, which is ultimately, finally, to save souls. All that we do in the church is to save souls. We are commanded of God to preach the gospel, God's power to every creature, Mark 16, 15. We are expected to be benevolent in our activities, doing for others what they cannot do for themselves, but needs to be done. And then to help each other remain faithful to the Lord, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. In other words, we're to help each other once we've been saved from past sins, added to the church by our Lord Himself, to help each other remain faithful. Whatever the New Testament teaches, faithfulness is, we are to help each other in all things to remain faithful. This is truly Christian, as that word is defined and used in the New Testament, fellowship. I may say also, as we've studied that word, we'll go back into it more now. So fellowship in Christ. Notice it's in Christ where we have this fellowship because we first of all have been brought into a saved relationship with God. We've been reconciled to God by our obedience to the gospel and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Imagine, and I'll just select this one item because of what it represents, of worship. Imagine not believing Christ as Son of God and yet partaking of the Lord's Supper. It shows forth His death Till he come again. Now who really should be partaking of that? Well, those who are in fellowship with God. Those who have been forgiven of sins by God. By their own will to submit to God's will. And that helps us understand better what this fellowship is within the blood-bought body of Christ. It's that which is peculiar and special because we are Christians of Christ. There are a lot of things we may do that have to do with associations that are not special and significant simply and only because we're members of the Lord's church. And that ought to be kept in mind. The inspired apostle John declared, and remember he wrote to Christians, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And again, I remind you that the verbs there in the Greek means keeps on cleansing. The very blood we contacted in being baptized into the death of Christ, which remitted all past sins, continues to cleanse us, but it's conditional that we walk 
in the light as he is in the light. The light of God's truth as we're faithful to God. Well, remember, faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So when I say I'm faithful to God, I'm doing those things the New Testament of Christ teaches that I must do as a member of the church to be a viable, faithful member of the church, showing my love of God, my faith in God, and my care for all things spiritual. He then says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, notice how that implies such an humble attitude, then he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us. His word's not in us. 1 John 1, 5 through 10. Uh, the idea is that we all need the blood of Christ. It's the only thing that can cleanse us from our sins. That blood, as I said, that we were baptized into and cleansed us when we were baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3, and 4, Colossians 2, 12, wherein he shed his blood, and he shed his blood in his death. So fellowship with God and fellowship with fellow Christians is a conditional thing. The Bible says, again, the same passage. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. That, of course, is fellowship with fellow Christians. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And that's his fellowship with God and Christ, his son. Fellowship, then, has three primary biblical meanings. Fellowship has three primary biblical meanings. First of all, to be joined with. Number two, to become a partaker, communion with, or a participant. And number three, to be a joint partaker, partnership. Now any one of these, or all three of them, may be, and at some time or another, is involved in Christian fellowship. So, the discussion on fellowship in Christ, fundamentally, primarily relates to our fellowship with Christ, our Savior, and God, our Heavenly Father. And our fellowship with each other as brothers and sisters in God's family, the church, the children of God, members of the Lord's church. Now a fundamental truth that must be understood is that fellowship with God must depend on being in Christ. And to be in Christ necessitates obedience to the gospel of Christ. Remember, the gospel is God's power to save. Romans 1.16. Jesus himself had said, as we quote most often, If you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8.31 and 32. <laughs> And you know well that he declared that we are to preach the gospel to every creature, going into all the world, doing so. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned or damned. Again, Mark 16, 15 and 16. And further on this matter, the first citizens born into the kingdom of God, Acts 2, 38 through 47, were they who were saved by their obedience to the truth found in the word of God relative to man's salvation, the incorruptible seed of the kingdom, the word of God, 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23, and Luke 8, verse 11, the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. Now, when a person is baptized into Christ, there's your doorway into Christ, into Baptized into Christ, our Lord adds that person to his church, the body of Christ, the family of God. He is born into the Lord's kingdom. He is a child of God. Not before, but then. Acts 2, 38 through 47. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 and John 3, 5. You have Paul reminding the churches of Galatia exactly when they became Christians, when he said... They were baptized into Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 27. All of this is connected to the fellowship that we enjoy in Christ. 
And if a person has not believed and from the heart obeyed that form of doctrine, Romans 6, 17, and 18, then they're out of fellowship with God. They cannot be in fellowship with members of the blood-bought body of the church. So there's a serious responsibility of the Christian. Again, a child of God, a member of the body of Christ, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, a family member in God's family, the church, to continue. I'll just go with that word continue. Keep on keeping on. To continue to abide in Christ. And of course, bear fruit. What kind of fruit? All that is involved in living the Christian life. Doing what the New Testament said Christians are to do. These facts, I think, are clearly stated in the Gospel of John chapter 15, verses 3 through 10. These are our, own, our Lord's own conclusions. So, first of all, verse 3. Of John chapter 15. Ye are clean through the word I have spoken unto you. Verse 3. Number 2. He said to them you cannot bear fruit. Except ye abide in Christ. Verses 4 and 5. And number 3. If you don't abide in Christ. That is if this is not possible. Then why, why the admonition of our Lord? He seemed to think you could. And then, of course, he says, if you don't abide in Christ, you're cast out, you're cast forth and burned. Verse 6, Jesus emphasized, if my words, notice the if, conditional, if my words abide in you. And then he said, if ye keep my commandments, verses 7 and 10. Now take all of this along with Acts 2.42. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, speaking of their church. With 1 John 1, 7, if you walk in the light, season of the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Put it all together along with any other verses like this. And you see the faithful work of members of the church laboring together under the head of the same mind and the same judgment. For they all know how to write and divide the word of truth. And they're doing what God requires them to do in order to remain saved in the church. Being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's fellowship. Fellowship in Christ depends on two basic issues. Or we may say principles. One is what we call moral turpitude. That's the conduct of your life. The way you live. The things you do and the things you don't do. Does that help you, for many who know this, understand why the late Leroy Brownlow wrote many, many years ago some do's and don'ts for the Christian? It gets down to that. It gets that specific. What I do and what I don't do, in some cases, how I do it, is going to determine why I go to heaven or hell. That's the whole idea behind these things. The next thing, besides moral turpitude, the way we live our lives in the church is doctrinal purity. Sound doctrine or sound teaching. Sound, as Paul used it to Titus and Timothy, means wholesome. It's that which is authorized by the New Testament. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A question of grave concern today is who may I fellowship as a Christian? You know, I must look to God to say, you can do this, you can do that. Have you ever had a child, or you remember as a child, that you would go to your mother usually and say, can I go over and play with whoever? That's a good attitude, a good mindset, a good view toward the authority of mother in the home. The child recognizes that and knows it has no business running off. Have you ever gotten in trouble, or maybe you got some of your own children in trouble or they got themselves in trouble because they slipped off to play and you didn't know where they were I think probably that's happened pretty often too well we're in the family of God don't you think that if we're faithful to him and all that faithfulness means that we ought to seek from Jesus whom we're to go play with who we're to associate with how we ought to act what our mindset is all of that gets into this business of fellowship. Trouble of it is, I find a number of preachers at places and everywhere I preach. 
who seem to think, well, I'm a member of the church. I'll do as I please. Nobody's going to tell me anything. Well, when you find that, you pretty well know they have departed from the faith. No child of God, as the Bible defines, child of God in faithfulness will take that disposition of heart. They're all seeking to be one in mind and judgment and action. Remember the fundamental meaning of fellowship of Christians, once we're in fellowship with God, is to work together. We'll work till Jesus comes. Under whose headship and guidance and direction? Jesus in his authoritative word, Colossians 3, 17. So should God's children fellowship those who are in God's family? Whom he does not fellowship. That's the big question. I suggest you being sort of swept on the rug among a lot of people who claim to be very fine folks. And they think of themselves in that way. This also means we need to know what each other believes and what each other are doing. Can you imagine in a physical home, the child say, Mom and Daddy, you know, he's about 13 or 14, that may start about then. Say, Mom and Daddy, I'll do as I please. You don't need to know my every move. Why would you respond? As a loving parent, knowing your responsibility to those children, how would you respond to a child that said, I'll do as I please? You don't need to know where I'm going. Or if when they've been somewhere you didn't know and they finally got home, say, where have you been? None of your business. But I see that done by numbers of brethren all the time. And some, even preachers, trying to say, that's all right. We shouldn't be that concerned. Let's just all agree to disagree. We've all been baptized into Christ. We've been added to the church. We all believe the Bible's the word of God. Well, what does all that mean if it doesn't mean we've changed our way of thinking in life? 1 Corinthians 1.10, being of the same mind and the same judgment. Let's first of all consider what I said about moral turpitude, the conduct of one's life. We'll emphasize that even further. The moral conduct of some members of the Lord's church in the first century was such that the inspired apostle Paul wrote, I wrote unto you, you know this almost sounds like a parent getting pretty stern after children. I wrote unto you, in my letter, my epistle, to have no company with fornicators. Can't you see a loving parent about a 15, 16 year old boy saying, you're not going down there anymore. I have told you and you've been raised different from that. Not to be involved with that crowd down there and where do I find you? That's basically what Paul's doing as an ambassador of the court of heaven, speaking as the Holy Spirit guided him, even in writing part of the New Testament. He says that. Then notice he went ahead and said, I wrote unto you not to keep company. If any man that's named a brother be a fornicator or covetous, you see God sees the covetous person the same way he does a fornicator, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. Now, knowing not to eat, you know, eating, you sit down with people you care about and enjoy being with. That's who you eat with. Have you ever seen a table full of people that hated one another? Well, that's not normal. I think probably you might see that in prison <laughs> where they're forced to eat the same table, but they might kill one another the next day if they get a chance. But normally, people enjoy eating with those they have much in common with. Well, you can kind of see what Paul's saying, can't you? That this business of Christian fellowship is special. It's not lightly taken. It's only for faithful members of the church of our Lord. Then notice concerning the uh, man having his father's wife living in that kind of fornication. He says, faithful members, if you will go to heaven, put away the wicked man from among yourselves. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. If you go over about eight chapters later, you'll find this same apostle writing the great chapter on love. Now, in the minds of some loony brethren and others, they cannot believe that this same Paul could write this, 1 Corinthians 5, and get over here and write about love because they have a false concept of love. If you have a view of love that says, Oh, let's leave them alone. 
then you're about like the person who says, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. That kind of love is not taught in the Bible except to warn you against it. And if you operate that way, there's no telling what you'll tolerate and put up with. The apostle wrote, have no, not some a little bit or some kind, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, show them for what they are by the authority of the New Testament. Ephesians 5.11. Now what I've just given to you is very simple to understand intellectually. But you see it gets in our emotions and our associations and we get all tied up and we weigh things in a lot of our own viewpoints. And do you know the place that's reserved for folks like that? Because there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But what's the end of it? Eternal separation from God and the devil's hell. Yeah, but I did this and I did that. and Well, have you ever noticed those people that the Lord condemns to hell? Lord, have we not done this, that, and the other in thy name? Uh, must be religious people. Doesn't sound like they deny Christ to be the Son of God. They're saying, but Lord, did we not do these things in thy name? We've done all these wonderful things. And the Lord never argues with them. He just says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And the everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. Woo, sounds like the lion came out of the lamb. And that's right. When he comes back the second time, it'll be the lion coming back and not the meek lamb. Bringing judgment in the light of his infallible word that you have if you have your Bible in your hands right now. That ties in with fellowship. The scriptures affirm that Christian fellowship is based on moral and doctrinal principles. Now you say, well, I don't know as so much about that. Well, then what would it be based on if it wouldn't be based on that? I wouldn't know what else to base it on except moral and doctrinal principles as they're set out plainly by the authority of the New Testament of the Christ. After all, it's Christ who said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. So there can be no question about the doctrine of Christ being a guide, infallible guide, the final and complete guide and standard for Christian fellowship. The inspired apostle Paul admonished the great young preacher Timothy, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them which indicates he's already in them. Don't get out of it. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. 1 Timothy 4, 16. Well, you know, I get pretty concerned about saving David Brown. Just write a sentence out here and say, I, put your name there, do not want to go to heaven. I, put your name there, Really looking forward to going to hell. You know, I, you surely will. But in reality, how we think and act, we almost might as well say that. Some of us. He warned Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season. American sense is urgent. I wish we could get urgent about something. You ever notice how things are important we're not very urgent about? Other things, well, we've got to jump on it immediately. Can we give you an example? Let the air conditioning go out. We'll fall over ourselves to try to get that fixed. Saving souls? Eh. Well, manage. <laughs> Does that make a lot of sense to you and what Bible you know? Preach the word. Be instant or urgent in season. And out of season. When they want it and don't want it. You still preach the word. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. That's what goes on when you preach the word. And do it suffering long with people. You know, as long as people are demonstrating that they want to learn, they're willing to learn, they're willing to correct their lives, you can bear with them a long time. In fact, that's how God bears with me. What do you think I would do, what God would do with me if I said, I've had it? I'm not going to say this by me long. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to do anything else. I'm tired after all these years. I quit. You think he's going to bear with me? Well, of course, I still have life on this earth and the flesh. I could turn and come back to what I knew was right. 
But do you think that he would say, yeah, he's a fine Christian. He's been a Christian for, preached the gospel for over 51 years. Uh, Why, yeah, just on the basis of that, I'll let him slide in the next few years. We'll just look at that part of his life and not finish out the last 5, 10, 15 years, whatever he's got. Or here's a man who's been derelict in his duty. His wife's been as faithful as a person could be. And he's thinking, well, you know, I'll get in on the basis of riding her coattail to heaven. Or I associate with members of the church all these years. Surely that association is good for me. It reminds me of the old joke of where the fellow up in Kentucky was going to enter his mule in the Kentucky Derby. And somebody said, well, you can't do that. He said he can't run worth anything. He's a mule to begin with. He's not a thoroughbred and had the training. He said, yes, but I thought the association would do him good. <laughs> well, that's the way some people think about the church. That's just about as shallow as you can get, but that's where a lot of brethren are. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. You never get rid of the doctrine if you want to go to heaven. Don't want to go to heaven, just get rid of the doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Wholesome teaching. But having itching ears, they'll heap to themselves, American Standard says it, themselves teachers after their own lust. Why do people change the plain, unadulterated Word of God? Why do they change it? Because of their own lust, their own desires. It's exactly why they change it. Remember the king that pinned knife God's word? Here's what the Bible says. You don't like it. He's cut it out. God went back and had to write another one. You can't get rid of it. The truth is here, and it'll meet you at the last day. And they'll turn away their ears from the truth and turn into fables, 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4. You know, that's, that's an every generation thing. I really wish, well, I think one of the greatest ploys the devil has is to think that we fought through one battle and there's no more left. That's just not right. The apostle also advised, but the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. How did they do it? How did they know the truth, love it, live it, and then leave it? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils or demons. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. Having their conscience here of the hot iron. That's how it works. Every departure from the Word of God is because people do this thing. They love what they love. And they're not going to change themselves to fit what the Lord said. Remember the matter of moral turpitude? Conduct of life. They want to do other things. Look, why do you think there's so much fornication going on? Because they don't like it. Why is there so much adultery going on? Because they hate it. Why do they drink like fish, alcohol, and every other kind of drug out there? Why do they do it? They don't like it? They hate it? Why do people steal money from banks? Maybe we understand that one. Quick way to get something. Of course, a few folks have, rather than got silver, got a little lead. Why do people do those things? Why do they put their lives in jeopardy? Well, it feels good or they like it or the only way I know how to describe it, you come up any other way, you figure it out. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life drives people. As this presidential election so sadly declares. Well, that's a good place to stop. There's a lot said there, not just because I said it. Because this gets right down to the nitty gritty of whether you're faithful to God. I'm not talking about people who are outside of Christ right now. I will in a minute. But I'm talking about you who have been baptized to Christ, who consider yourselves Christians, members of the church. What is your life? What are you doing and not doing? How are you of value to the Lord as one of His children? How concerned are you about the taking of the gospel to the lost? How much time do you spend in Bible study and prayer? How much time do you spend in helping the church be stronger in its knowledge and practice of the truth? Encouraging people. And rebuking them when you need to. Because what did I say a moment ago that the Bible plainly declares? Part of this fellowship is that we help each other keep doing what God said do. And sometimes some of us stop. Think about the people that miss worship. Now this morning we got more out due to sickness and traveling than we had a long time. 
But I venture there's some people that could be here that verbally would defend the truth of New Testament Christianity, but they're somewhere else. Now, why are they there? Why don't you go find out, lest you become one of them? You see, are we paying attention to who's in the assembly? And if they're not, do you ever say, I wonder why? I wonder why. And then go find out. I want you to think about this. How much information technology is out there? But how often is it used just to find out where a brother or sister was when they weren't at worship? Used for everything else under the sun. We keep up one another all day long every day. We can ride in that thing that my dog burped this morning. My cat made a strange racket. The baby scratched the end of its nose. My mother slapped my daddy. <laughs> but we can't say, where were you today? As a Christian, I missed you in the assembly. I don't see that much. In fact, I don't think I ever have. And if you don't want the whole world to know it, well, they have private messaging. Yeah. Did you notice that on that? Private messaging. That means it can be known only to you, God, and who you privately message. Why can't we use these things to the glory of God Almighty and the salvation of souls rather than to talk about oatmeal? Tell me, what does that say about our mindset? Where our interests really are? How deep we are in Christianity? Or how so very shallow we really are? And how does it truly reveal the depths of the shallowness of our dedication to our Savior. If you're not a Christian this morning, we hope you'll begin your fellowship with God by becoming a Christian. It's the only way you can to believe in Christ based upon His Word, that He is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in the Christ and to complete your obedience to the Gospel by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of your sins. Now I add you to the church when you do that. You're a Christian, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the church that Jesus built and purchased with his blood. Now in that church, are you willing to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? That is to be in fellowship with one another, others who've done just exactly what I said. Don't you want to be saved and remain saved? Don't you want to go to heaven? If as a child of God you've been derelict in your duty, then repent of those sins, confess them, and ask God for forgiveness. If they're public, we'll pray with you and for you as you confess those sins. And God in his loving kindness will forgive. He wants to forgive. But we have to make the decision to comply with his will so he can. Are you subject to the Lord's invitation? If so, come while we stand and sing.